Hi, this is Camille Spencer, and today I'll be reading from my novel, Truth or Dare. I can't place this. Jesse, Jesse, huh? Jesse, the power's up, the whole place is pinch. I bolt up, still in bed and still in a fog. Huh, are you serious? No, really, I needed an excuse to slide into bed with you, Hadley says. Of course I'm serious. But there's a lag between her words hitting my ear and the time it takes to actually register with my brain. I get out of bed, a warm bed, a comfortable bed, and I dog ear the flannel behind me. A rush of cold jets up my pants and straight down my neck. Damn, I think. I was actually having a pretty good dream there. Can't I just go back into that? But I'm wide awake the second I flip the switch, as in on, and nothing happens. I've lived here for eight years, and I've never, ever lost power, and I'm not even the least bit prepared for this. I stretch my hands out, sightless, finding a familiar door frame, and then the front room. It never dawned on me how much light shines in from the outside until it's gone. I see Hadley's silhouette against the window, burritoed in a thick blanket she pulled from her makeshift bed on the couch, which is unmade. I make my way over. The refrigerator stopped humming, she says, brushing the hair off her forehead. That's what woke me. It doesn't look like anyone else is up. What should we do? I ask, dumbfounded. Don't look at me. Then memory hits, one of those deja vu things. Remember way back when, when you tripped the power off and freaked out because you thought you broke the house? Yeah, I chuckle. You were over at my parents' house, just like this. We had the whole humongous house to ourselves. They went away, right? That was awesome, I say with a nudge. No kidding. This was the era of slick new technology called CDs that played Dave Matthews and Nirvana. It's when plastic handlebags at the grocery store were new and novel and not yet the environmental disaster they are today. Movies were just beginning to be affordable on purchase on VHS, so everyone wanted a home movie library, including me. And computers were at someone else's house, not your own. And we all wore bobs. You built a bonfire, she says, with a far-off look. I did. I'm a lumberjack, what can I say? Just hand me an axe and call me Paul Bunyan. I did wear flannel, and I do remember feeling rather rugged and scout-like when that flame smarked, even though that bonfire was hibachi with grates removed. Hardly rugged. She didn't have to know that I had absolutely no confidence in myself up until that moment, the orange flame lit. In reality, I went through two packs of matches as she wandered the yard, gathering bits of sticks that had fallen from trees. I wink at her rather smugly. You were impressed. Her cheeks flush. I love toying with her. What, with your culinary finesse? We ate s'mores for dinner. We did, and you love them, don't lie, all chocolatey and marshmallowy gooey. I was 16. Was it really that long ago? We were really young. I was still a virgin. She laughs through her nose. That can't be right. I didn't even know you when you were five. Shut up. That was the best night ever, she says, with a shoulder bump. What, losing power, breaking the house? No, we sat up in front of the bonfire and played truth or dare. I chuckle. Yeah, the dangers of truth or dare. Come on, I told you too much that night. And that rainbow sunset, remember? I do remember that sunset. Fiery, red, melting orange, dissolving teal, smudging indigo. The air was wet, the kind that curls your hair. All those fireflies. You got that humongous bedspread out, and we found the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. A smile curls up her cheek as I duck under our blanket. You know, she says. If I could point to one moment when our friendship began, it was that night. You could say that. I'm not sure what came into me that night. As I recall, I think I tried to make a move on her. You know how it is when you're a teenager. Parents being gone is the best thing ever. Add an illicit sleepover with a hot girl and you're golden. And truth or dare got a lot out of her. One, that she liked girls. And two, she was sort of into me. Sort of, she told me with air quotes. And even when crazy bad shit happens in our lives, we pull each other through. To this day, that's kind of cool. I can see my pajama top peeking out from under the blanket, along with a wee bit of cleavage. Hadley's blessed in that department. I am not. Her wet clothes are hanging in my shower, and I'm pretty sure they'll stay damp without heat going. Whatever. She'll look way sexy in my clothes tomorrow. And her bedhead right now, she kind of looks like we just did the deed. I raise my eyebrow at the thought. What? Nothing, I lie. Listen, we can't just sit here in the dark. It'll get colder. I can actually see my breath. We need to call someone, see what's up. She shuffles to find her phone. That's when I catch a flashlight moving around room to room in an apartment across the way. 
Then one flashlight splits into two, and those beams bobble their way window to window. It's pretty hilarious. The snow's still intense. There were benches, but now those are buried, and taking a wild guess, I'd say we have about two feet. What's this? You rearranged, Hadley asked, breaking me out of my drowsy voyeurism. Where's the phone book? When I turn, she's carrying her phone, like our own flashlight. In the kitchen drawer, I hobble toward it. Under a box of envelopes, some click pens, a random loose cap, my wallet, and car keys, I find that thick bound yellow book. Do people use these still? I use Google. I drop it on my counter with a thump and start flipping thin sheets of newsprint. Meanwhile, she's sparking the lighter inside a few pillar candles and carrying one over to help me read. Careful not to drain her phone battery. Don't tip it, the wax will spill. She leans in and I'm reminded again of how busty this girl is. Pressed against my arm, for a second I forget it's Hadley and get a little worked up. Re T's W, here's W, and here's the number. She recites the digits, sliding a perfectly manicured nail down the shadowed page of bolded letters. I listen as her phone beeps with every number, a ring. Outage, she says, rolling her eyes. Report an outage. I get a fake smile before she presses that tiny receiver against my ear. Why me, I protest, it's your apartment. I have no time to think before hearing the dreaded recording. She's still pressed against me, and it takes more than a little effort just to focus on what the heck I'm supposed to do. I click through a string of options, choosing two, then three, and finally reporting the outage. When I end the call, Hadley's stare is more than a little nervous. This night can't get any weirder. First my car, then your ex, now this. Alicia's showing up. Yeah, I laugh. I'm glad you were here. Why? Why? Isn't that obvious? She shakes her head. For starters, you're an excuse to come back. I tip my eyebrow. Plus, you're my rock. You know that. Aw, oh, Jess, look at you. You're getting all sappy on me. Sap, I'm not. I just appreciate you. That's all. You know. We share a long, comfortable pause, frozen with the same corny grins. Then she lets her head tip back, as if unsure of the next move, which is when it dawns on me that it's kind of hot her head tilted back like that. So when she's not looking, I find my eyes dawdling down her shirt again and I linger a little too long. That's when I sort of forget where I am and zone out. When I look back up, she's looking right at me, which is why I dart my eyes away so quickly, but not before a dash of apprehension settles in the pit of my stomach. It's too dark, I tell myself, she didn't see. On the topic of Alicia, can I just say, I don't care who did what to whom, do what's right for you, but she pauses. I motion for her to continue. Well, do you realize that something sabotages every relationship you've ever had? And it always happens when you give a shit about them. The only exception being Ella. If words could physically pierce my heart, that last one did. Don't even go there. And now with Alicia, something seriously messed up with that. I love you, but... So this is my fault? I feel bad for her. Why would you say that? She wants you back. She can't have me back. Her eyes roll. Why would you want me with her? I'm not saying you should go back to her, she says. Then what are you saying? I'm just wondering. What? I don't know, like if you're afraid of commitment or something? No, I answer. She gives me her don't mess with me face. No, I'm not afraid of commitment. And? And what? If you're over Ella. Whoa, where'd that come from? I don't know, are you? Of course I am. Sometimes I wonder, why is she so angry all of a sudden? I'm not quite following. This is a topic we don't speak of. What could have been with Ella and me had I not okay, had I not been such a commitment foe? Full disclosure, maybe I used to be. Maybe I fucked up there. Maybe if I hadn't, this might be our anniversary. Do I care that she's celebrating her anniversary this weekend? No, Ella's an old habit. We've changed. That simply will never be again. Even if we both wanted it, which we don't. I walk over to my couch and her bed of blankets topped with two pillows. I'm not going to spend the evening fighting with my best friend, that's for sure. Besides, we're stuck together all night, like it or not. So we might as well get along. I sit smack dab in the middle of a makeshift bed, kick my heels up, stocking footed, and pat the couch beside me. Come on, I say, gesturing her over. Let's make up. 
She makes her way to the couch. I guess the only way we're going to stay warm is bundling up, she says, as if surrendering. Then she binds herself, using two hands to secure the top of that blanket. When she does, I think back to being caught peering down her shirt and have to wonder, is she doing this deliberately to block my inappropriate view? Once she sits next to me, I prop my arm around her and yank her stubborn self into my chest, and here come those nerves again. Give me some of that stingy, I tell her with a tug. She breaks out of burrito mode and offers me a wee corner, which I graciously accept. She's never been the generous type, so I take what I can get. When I do, she reclines against me. I inhale, and it's my shampoo. In the silence, a muffled whoop of snow hits the ground. I sit in this, this here and now, the faraway look in her eyes, the sleepy sultriness in her voice, but with some angst. With her body pressed against mine, I try to recall a time in my life when I've ever felt this much love unconditionally towards another human being, and I can't. I hear her swallow. The building settles, and more snow crashes to the ground. Soon, the moment passes, and my drowsiness takes over. My body begins to collapse. Look, we can't sleep here, I say. We can share my bed, but don't get any ideas. Keep flattering yourself. Her hand rests on her knee. At the count of three, we rise in unison, huddled and waddling clumsily to the bed, giggling as if we were still 16. I'm feeling more than a little something here. I don't think she actually thinks of me that way, at least not since that faded bonfire a good 20 years ago. In bed, I'm tempted to reach over to her side and see where my hand might land on a hip, down the slope of her waist. Damn, I want to touch her skin, her lips, those curves that fill up my pajamas way better than I ever could. If I did, though, then what? Are you awake? That voice of hers jars me, and I'm drowned in shame as if she heard my thoughts. Yeah, I can't sleep. It's too quiet. The sleepy stillness envelopes us. Me either. It's an unnatural silence. I was just thinking, and, well, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you? For what? I ask. For always being here for me. Like, even now, when the car breaks down... I don't know what I'd do without you. Thanks for letting me crash here. I roll over, put her back's to me. Then I put my hand on her shoulder. In my world, she's here for me tonight. She's always here for me. And I tell her just that. I'm a basket case. You're doing me a favor. Whatever, Jess. Weak-willed, I push my luck and scoot in, pressing up tight against those curves of hers and reaching an arm around the nook of her waist. She doesn't even flinch. Instead, she takes my hand in hers on the other side. I don't think I've ever actually held her hand. I feel her from my chest to my hips and knees, making it excruciating to resist going further. Molding against her, I effectively eradicate any chance of falling asleep. But I won't push it. I need to work through this, whatever it is. You're such a tease, she tells me. If she only knew. Right now, you're the only heater I've got, so don't get any ideas. I grin at my little white lie. Then I hear, I love you, babe. Love you too, I say. Sweet dreams. You've been listening to me, Camille Spencer, doing a reading from my novel, Truth or Dare.